Okay, I'm back uh, with Ron Thompson, uh, world expert, I believe, uh, and a man that the world doesn't know enough about and doesn't hear enough from, because I think Ron has done, has had enough experience and done enough research to have a lot of answers to some very, very difficult questions that uh, challenge everybody in the wildlife and the conservation field. But um, I want Ron to do the talking. So Ron, uh, welcome back. Thanks again for your time. My pleasure. Ron, let's just go back to uh, the, the hunting story. Um, and I know you've got very strong, well-informed views on the pros and cons. And um, I just want to want you to kick off with your with your ideas on the different types of wildlife populations and the way one should approach sustainable wildlife in terms of numbers and sustainability. Well, let me start off by saying. Um, that hunting is a, is a natural instinct of man. Um, these people who say we must stop hunting is absolute rubbish. But hunting is a, is a natural instinct of man. And hunting is a tool of management. Um, the, there's only one way to, to, to harvest animals that are multiplying like mad. I mean, your elephants double their numbers every 10 years. And a lot of animals like spring bucks in, in good year can double their numbers in one year. And what do you do with all these extra animals? You have to remove them. And um, uh, there's only one way to remove them. You can catch them and take them away if you like. One way you can do it, but the classical way of doing it is to hunt them. And um, people say it's a horrible thing to shoot an elephant. And they say to me, how can you possibly shoot an elephant? You know, it's very easy. You can just pick up a rifle, you aim at the brain and you pull the trigger. And the elephant drops dead. And I think what we must understand about this is that man is the only natural predator on this earth in the, in the elephant field. There's no other animal predates upon uh, um, another animal like, like, like the elephant except for man. And it's about time that society started to understand that in order for us to maintain our elephant populations in the proper numbers and in balance with their habitat is that we should eliminate them. Botswana area who've got something like 200,000 elephants, they must get rid of half of them. How are they going to do that if they're not going to shoot them and kill them or if they're not going to catch them and take them away? We have to, the, the, the solution to, to the Botswana scene is to, is to actually reduce the numbers. Now you can reduce the numbers by catching them and taking them somewhere else or you can go in and you can shoot them. Um, but the crux of the matter is they have to be reduced in number, whichever way you do it. And if you don't like hunting, well, don't come and watch it. Let people who know what they're um, doing go about it and do it. We have to get the elephants down to the right levels. And um, when you think that Wanky and um, Botswana are in the region of, of 20 times too many elephants in their habitats, the elephants have trashed their habitats. Kruger National Park is 10 times too many elephants above the carrying capacity. What, what else can you do? But what, what society has to understand and start thinking about this seriously, the British Prime Minister stopping trophy hunting and things like that is absolute nonsense. He must start thinking that what does a farmer do when he's breeding sheep or cattle when they get too many? He sends them to the abattoir. So... Hunting does the same thing for elephants and, and all these other animals, buffaloes, all these sorts of things. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, a condition of your mind. You just have to accept the fact that this goes on. And if you don't, if you are one of these people in the big cities of the world who have lost touch with nature, if you insist that we must not kill anything at all, then you, you will be responsible for the total destruction of the entire biodiversities of all the national parks in Africa. Ron, so, just um, talk a bit about this this issue that that's raised by the animal rights activists, which is anti-trophy hunting, um, and pointing a finger at hunters going after big tuskers, saying, you know, that the big tuskers are essential to the survival, to the gene pool, and and to the survival of elephant. That is that is the word that is out there and is accepted very much as a sort of accepted wisdom. Um, I'm interested to know what you think of that. 
Well, I worked out a, an explanation that satisfies myself on this. Let me, let me throw it at you. Whatever animal you're thinking of has got, the species has got an expected, um, a life expectancy. Like the elephant, the life, normal life expectancy is 60 years. A lion's life expectancy is about 12 years. And if you take those years and divide them into four life quarters, you, you, can, you can divide the animal's life history into four different blocks where they are actually functioning differently in each of those blocks. Take the elephant. The elephant has got a, a, a one quarter life expectancy of 15 years. It takes four 15 years to make up to 60. It's 60 years, the elephant runs out of teeth and it dies of starvation if it reaches that, that level. So the first quarter of elephants is that they, um, they are born, they drink milk from their mothers, they learn how to eat adult food. And as they're growing up at, at about 12 years old, the bulls and the cows um, start their, their breeding cycles. The cows' ovaries, ovaries start to develop, eggs, eggs are developed in their, in their ovaries. With the bulls, the testes are actually producing sperm when the animal is, is 12 years old. But that just hangs on, hangs on for a few years until, I don't know what happens, but something triggers off, and it happens in all these animals, something triggers off the, um, the behavior of, of the population. And with elephants, cows actually start bullying the young bulls and chase them out of the cow herds. You will see them in, in, in some of the captive um, herds that they've got here in South Africa. Uh, you will see the cows, when the bulls get about 15 years old, 14, 15 years old, the cows tusk them and butt them and chase them away from them. They don't want them in the herd. Whether they're starting to interfere with the breeding cycles of the other cows or something, I don't know. But there is definitely a reaction there. So at 15, your, your, your young bull elephant, and I'm talking about bulls here particularly, they leave the maternal herds and they then have to go and live with the bulls. Now, what most people don't understand is that in bull, in bull society, in elephant society, your bulls live a separate life to your cows. Your cow herds go around with the matriarch and the, and, and the matriarch's daughters and their, their, their babies form the breeding herds. Um, and the bulls go off on their own. They, they almost live a solitary life, although you will often find them within sight of each other, three, four, five of them within sight of each other, if they're crop raiding, they will often go crop raiding together at night. Um, so you will get three or four bulls going into a land to, to, to eat, eat mealies or, or, or whatever else the crop is. But generally speaking, your bulls don't live with the cows. That's the thing I want to get over. Um, but they do have a loose society of their own. Once they're 15, the young bulls go and join up with their peers their peers are normally bigger than they are anywhere because at that age, they're teenagers and they're, they're growing quite quickly. Between the age of 15 and 30, which is your second life quarter for elephants, your young bulls are feeling their oats and they are, they're growing up, they're in increasing in size. Now, one thing about elephants, and this is a little bit of a, a mix up, is that from, from a very early age, when, when before they've even weaned, you find young bulls at the water holes in, in the breeding herds will, will match up with, with other young bulls and you will see them sparring with each other, banging each other on the head, pushing each other from one end of the, of the water hole to the other, all the way around it. And, and, and it, it is a bullying tactic. I suppose it's the same sort of, sort of thing you will often find in, in junior schools with humans. They, they bully each other. Um, but they also, they see the little girls running around or they smell the, the, the young cows and oestrus and they develop an interest, a sexual interest in them, but they're not allowed to explore that because the bigger bulls won't allow these young bulls in their second life period, that is between 15 and 30, will not allow them to come into must. An elephant will breeds when it, a bull breeds when it comes into must and it only breeds with a cow that is an oestrus. So these young bulls, we know from 12 years old, are able to, to, to produce sperm. So they're capable of, of copulating and breeding.
but they're not allowed to. And uh, and if they don't listen to what their adults tell them, or, or the, their big brothers tell them, then they get thumped. They get they get pushed around. And if you if you're wise to this and you watch a, a group of elephants at a waterhole, for example, in a game reserve, you will see some elephants are more dominant than others. The bull elephants, and they will go up to an, um, another bull elephant, and it, it may not even be have tusks as big as that. If it's got the character to be able to challenge the other animal, you'll find that the one will give way, it will be submissive, and then the other one will get his way in whatever he wants to do. So fighting is, is actually inherent in their society, but it doesn't happen in the second quarter because the bulls in the third quarter, that is between 30 and 45 years old, these are in the prime of their life. They are, the, they are big, big in, in size, uh, big, their tusks are growing heavily and they come into musk on a re regular basis. And the, the bulls that come into musk are the ones that are highest in rank. It's not a question of when you reach a certain age, you can come into musk. You can't come into musk because um, mentally these older bulls keep the younger bulls out of musk. So what happens then is that the in, in that third phase, this is when all the breeding takes place. The, 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 the mature bulls have already by then, through the fighting that starts off from, from tiny babies, constantly fighting, um, they have got a rank. And when they, when they appear in a group of bulls at a water hole, say, you'll see bulls moving aside and letting them pass. They don't challenge them at all. Now, part of, part of this structure in, in the, social structure of the elephant is that in trying to demonstrate to their brothers that they are more dominant, they've got a higher rank than they have, is that at, at, at lunchtime they will go to sleep in the heat. After that is over and they wake up again and they have to go out and start feeding, you find the first thing these young bulls, particularly in their second, in their, their second life quarter, the first thing they do is to go and start pushing down, down trees. And to eat them, just to push them down. And they're pushing down big trees. And, and it's a question of saying, well, look, look at me, I can push this big tree down. I'm bigger and tougher than you are, therefore my rank is higher than you. It's all part and parcel of this growing up with elephants. Then you get the breeding in that, in that third quarter. Once, once they pass the third quarter, move into the fourth quarter, that is in the, in the bracket between 45 years old and 60, what happens then is that the their teeth start wearing out. They have six sets of molars, the bulls, to the cows as well. They have six sets of molars and they push in into the jaws from the back and they push the front tooth out further and further forward until it falls out or it crumbles and it falls out. And then another tooth comes in from behind. And throughout that 60 years, they are replacing their, their molars. They've got six different sets until when, when they're in, in the, at the end of their, of their tether, the end of their age, the, um, the teeth fall out, the last tooth falls out and the elephant can no longer chew its food. So therefore it dies with the, traditionally they say it then dies of starvation. But in actual fact, what they have found a lot now in Kruger National Park, for example, is that 20 or 30 years ago, they were getting some very, very big tusked elephants. I mean, some of them had tusk up to 155, 156 pounds aside. Great big tusk, huge big and big, big elephants. And a lot of those elephants were senile. They had, they, they'd lost, they, they were skin and bone in, in, in one respect, but they, they had stopped producing teeth. And because they weren't producing teeth, more, more calcium went into, into the ivory. And this is why at that stage, the ivory got bigger and, and what have you. But if they have to now go and breed, if these are the bulls that these so-called experts overseas tell us that they've got the gene pool in, in, in their system and they've got to be able to spread it out, those bulls are old. It's like old men, an old man being confronted by a younger man who's got a nice girl on his arm. They haven't a hope in Hades. A fourth quarter animal hasn't a hope in Hades of defeating a third quarter bull because it, it, it's, it's older. It's, it's infirm, it's all these different things, it's becoming old. So in order for them to come into must, if they start coming into must, they will fight with these other young bulls 
and and there, what is happening in Kruger today is that very few bulls are reaching the age of 60 now. And most of the bulls, the big bulls that are being killed by other bulls through contest are in, in, the, in, the, in their late 40s. So, so the life cycle has actually been reduced because of the, of the fact that there are so many elephants in, in Kruger at, at this time. So to say that the elephants, the old elephants with the very big tusks are carrying the, the gene pools and that they are still mating with the cows is absolutely a load of hogwash. So is there, is, is there more friction amongst elephants now in Kruger and are they finding more of the older bulls uh, that have, have been killed in, in combat? What, what surprised me, I've just done a survey up in Kruger and um, I had a, um, one of the staff explain to me what had been happening previously. And, and at Letaba camp, they have got a museum there with all the skeletons of the very big bulls, the big famous bulls from, from, from the, the Kruger's heyday. And they were all in their late fifties when they died. And a lot of them were found with, with um, wounds in their skulls going through to the brains where the younger bulls were tusking them, beating them up, getting them down and tusking them into the brain and killing them. And I, it's, it, this is a new innovation for me. Um, I, I didn't know that it was so frequent. I, I knew that they fought every now and again, but this seems to be a, um, a procedure. And the elephants that have been dying in the last decade have all been under, under 50. The ones, or, or, or yes, um, certainly not up to 60. So, so the, whole, the whole age structure of the elephants in Kruger at the moment is actually declining, that they're actually maturing and moving out of the system in the, in, in, in the, the very early parts of their fourth quarter. They're not reaching anywhere near the end of it. So even if these bulls were able to, to mate or, or could mate, they weren't mate because they're being killed. It's opening a bit of a can of worms because it, the whole world went into uh, a frenzy over the over the incident. But going back to Cecil the lion, at the time of uh, the reported uh, death of, of Cecil the lion, the world uh, was adamant that this was a lion in its prime and this was hunters at their destructive best uh, taking out a um, a fertile male and thereby impacting negatively on the lion population of the area. Uh, I'm interested in your, in your take on that. To be able to explain this properly, I'm going to have to take you right back and put you through this cycle of, of a lion's life, the four quarters of a lion's life. Now, as I said, um, we know that in Kruger, sometimes the, the lions have in the past reached a, a ripe old age of 15, but that's very unusual. Um, the, if we take the life quarter at, at three years, which is probably more like it, what, what happens is that cubs are born into a pride. And there may be one or two males in that pride that are controlling everything that's going on. If there are two males, two adult males, one is more dominant th than the other. It's submissive. So that if they have a squabble, it doesn't end up with the one killing the other. And the other sort of sits on the sidelines, but uh, whether they, there's other young, the non-dominant ones breed or not, or breed very much, I can't tell you. But this, but the fact that you have got two males and four, three, three four females with them, and they, they will have cubs, um, that is well known. When those cubs are babies, they suckle from their mothers. Um, they then share the pride food. When the lions lions kill, um, the, the, the lions, if it's a big male does the killing, he, he roars in the middle of the night and pulls the whole over to him to go and feed there. But a lion can, can deal with about 28, 30 pounds of, uh, of, of food a week. And, and that does them. They don't have to eat every day. Now, um, or is it kilos? It's 30 kilos a day, uh, a week. Um, and then they just spend most of their time just lying around. But as these cubs are growing up, if it's a big pride, then to be able to keep that big pride going, the males have to kill big animals like giraffe and buffalo, which they do. 
if it's a if it's a smaller pride, then they can catch wildebeest and zebra, and that keeps them going. But those little cubs ha then have to compete with the with the big members of the pride. And there's a different definite hierarchy in the feeding. The big male lions, they grab number one place. Then they won't even let the females feed if they're hungry. Next come the females. After the big males fed, the females are able to feed on the carcass. Then the, then the younger, younger ones, and so on, right down to the babies. And most lions, most lion prides, lose about 50% of their, of their babies in the first 12 months of their year, of, of their lives. Um, so the, they, they're very prolific breeders. They will have four or five cubs, two, three, four or five cubs. Um, and during the year, as things are going, depending on how the killing goes, um, they, will lose, they will lose the cubs. And they will lose the cubs largely to, to starvation. Um, there will be times when the big males aren't there, when other males will come in, stray males, and, and they will kill the cubs as well. Or hyenas will do so. But they lose their cubs regularly. At about age... 22 months to 24 months, the young males are then taller at the shoulder than their mothers. They grow very quickly. But then they start interfering with the sexual activity of, of the family's social structure. If a female comes into oestrus, um, then the young males sniff around. I don't even think the females like that. The male, big males certainly don't. So at the age of about 22, 24 months, uh, young lions are evicted by their parents from the pride. They then become nomads, and, um, a nomad or, or vagrants. They then have to go out. Um, if they stay in the pride, they will be killed by, by the big males. Because by then, they, 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 they're no longer little baby cubs. They don't say, this is my son, whatever my name, his name is. They say, this guy here is interfering with my pride now, and we've got two big males here already. We don't need any more, so they'll chase him out. And that, that cub or those cubs, and this happens in every pride, and those cubs or young lions as they are then, um, they have to go out and, and uh, start a living on their own. They have to learn how to kill. They haven't been taught how to kill, but they, they very quickly do the, uh, learn. They, they certainly do that. Um, and then they, they grow up, and they grow up in, in little families of nomads. But wherever they go in the game reserve, there are other prides of lions with big males there. And as soon as the big males see these young nomads, they chase the hell out of them and, and, and they have to run away. Um, and they are all the time looking not for, a, not for a, a, um, a territory of their own, a territory to do with breeding, but just a home range. And a home range is a place where they're they are familiar with their environment. There's enough food to keep them going. And, and you get cohorts of these of these young males, and particularly young males, but females are with them, um, that have been kicked out of the pride, and they have to grow up on their own in absolute dreadful fear of being caught with their pants down by one of these other big males, because they will kill them. So they are pushed around from pillar to post all day and all night, and, um, and the, the uh, dominant males in the prides, it's their job to keep the pride clean of all these nomads. The nomads then go out and they, they, they are also chased around. They, they have to find a place to live of their own. And they, they very often they move out of the game reserve. They move in, into the private lands or the tribal trust lands or the farms outside the game reserve. And there, what do they find? They find cattle, sheep and goats. And they say, well, we've landed in, in the lap of luxury. And they start then becoming stock killers. And most of the... Um, most of the, the, the stock killers, most of them, I've shot a lot of them, and, and most of them are young nomads. And they're normally, they're normally about three years old. And once they get over that, then, then they start getting a little bit more savvy as to how to survive. But they are nomads living with no territories. And generally speaking, the ones that survive are the ones that don't even look for, for home rangers of their own. They just kill, eat, and move on. We had one, one animal down in the Guai Valley outside Wanky National Park when I was a young ranger that um, in, a, in just over a year or so, it had killed 101 head of cattle, just one lion. 
And not on one farm, it was moving from farm to farm because once it killed and had eaten, it left what was left of its carcass and it moved off. So it, it went onto a new farm where the farmer wasn't used to it being there. So, and that's how it survived. They become very clever. Um, and then what happens is they, they, at about six or seven years old, they are big. They are as big as any other big lion. And they are then now starting to feel that they want a pride. They want to, to have cubs of their own. They want to have um, uh, a pride of their own. And they start fighting then and contesting the big males for ownership of the prides. And uh, by now they've, they're beyond the nomad stage. By now they, they are just single lions spoiling for a fight wherever they can, trying to defeat the old men or the old men who, who control the tribes, or the prides. Um, and this is when there's a tremendous amount of killing goes on. The, 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 the big prides, if, they, if the males are strong enough, they will challenge the others and kill kill um, the other younger males that are trying to usurp them. Cecil, for example, he and, and his so-called brother, they, they had formed a team. And when, when they were only eight or nine years old, um, or eight years old, they had challenged a, a big male in Wanky National Park. And uh, he was so badly damaged that they, the, the, the Cecil's brother was killed. The dominant male of the pride was so badly damaged, the game rangers had to come in and shoot him because he was in a horrible state. Cecil himself was pretty badly uh, beaten up. It was quite a vicious fight. And these fights are something to, to, to think about. And um, eventually he pushed off, he limped off, and he went to another part of the game reserve where he got his own pride going. And, uh, and then he, he joined up with another, another male. <laughs> and the two of them formed a, a pride. He was a very handsome male. A male says so, but he went through a number of prides where he was unsuccessful in chasing the other men away. But eventually, got his own pride, and he was the, he he teamed up with a younger male, slightly younger male. Uh, so he, there were I think there were four male, four females, and two males in the in the in the Kennedy Flay area of Wanky, and uh, and there he settled down. He was the the animal rightist had this big story that that he was the tourist attraction in Wanky National Park. Couldn't possibly be because he only had one tourist season there to make himself world famous. And, and that just didn't happen. It was all absolute rubbish. But it was, these were lies that the animal just told. There was a particular man in, um, in Harare at the time called Rodriguez, Johnny Rodriguez. And he had a, 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 an NGO there, an animal rights NGO uh, called... Um, um, I forget forget the name now, but it was an animal rights organization. He'd been trying to get funding for it for a long time. And he went and he, he filmed. The next thing he hears is that Cecil has been shot and killed by a hunter. Now, Ron, uh, what had sorry, happened in Ron, you, you broke up there. It's quite important. I'm sorry. Can you start again with Johnny Rodriguez? It started dropping. So, so just... Johnny Rodriguez and carry on. All right. His 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 organization was called the um, Zimbabwe um, Wildlife Task Force or something, something like that. And it was an, it was an NGO, it was an animal rights movement. He he went in into Wanky one year and he saw this beautiful big lion and he took photographs of it and everything and he started making a a scene of of this famous lion. The next thing he hears is that Cecil has been shot by a hunter. By a dentist from Minnesota in, in America. And uh, he couldn't understand how this could have happened. So he manufactured a story, and it was a manufactured story, um, that the, 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 the American hunter and his PH had gone in, gone through uh, uh, the Kennedy farm there called a a Antoinette Game Ranch. They drove in at night with half a wildebeest at the back of their vehicle. They had found Cecil in his pride. They chucked the, the beast out and tied it to the tail hitch of the Land Rover and they dragged it back across the railway line and into An Antoinette. And, and Cecil had religiously followed this onto um, Antoinette. And that's how they got him out of the game reserve. They'd actually gone in and poached him in the game reserve and brought him out. But I want to know how, how this, <laughs> this guy was so great. 
you could go into a pride of lions, which numbered four big lionesses, two big males, um, and a whole lot of half-grown animals, which were all hungry. And he managed to get Cecil, and nobody else but Cecil, to get behind this thing and drag, it, drag, drag him back, uh, out of the area um, in, in, in pursuit of, of this carcass. That just didn't happen. And we know it didn't happen because now we know, now we know that Cecil was in fact had been deposed for about three months on Antoinette Game Ranch. He had been defeated by the young male in his pride and he'd been kicked out. So he then became an old nomad. He then had to go and find a place to live on his own as the young nomads had done. And the best thing thing to do was to get out of where all the big lions are because they were all threatening to kill him. So he went onto a private game ranch. And when he was on the private game ranch, the game rancher fed him uh, to keep him there so that he could get a hunter in to come and shoot him. That was his job. It was a, it was a hunting game ranch. And th there was nothing wrong with that. But he certainly was not enticed out of the park. That I do know. And he certainly was not poached in any other way because the, the, the hunter, his licenses were, were all, were, were all in, intact, they were fine. But this didn't suit Ron, uh, Johnny Rodriguez because he was looking, he was seriously looking to get finance for his, his NGO. And so he made up these stories. Then he made up the story the, that the day after he had been shot and that wasn't it a terrible shame that this hunter from America had come and all he wanted was the lion's head and the rest of the bone into the bush. That is absolute nonsense. The, the lion was skinned as a trophy and that, that takes a lot of effort and a lot of expertise to do properly. All the eyelids had to be cleaned, the nose had to be cleaned, the gums had to be cleaned, the ears had to be cleaned. But what they normally do is they, they skin, skin, take the skin off the main body and then they they, they, they cut the head off when it's still attached to the skin and then they turn the skin on the head inside out and they take the skull out and then it's very carefully cleaned and, and the skull is boiled and clean because it goes, it goes with the skin as, as a trophy. Um, and then, and I've done this myself lots of times, is now you're presented with a, with a lion carcass without a head because you've, it's, it's come off without any pores because they've also got it clean was very carefully right down to each nail it's a, a meticulous job to to, to um, trophy skin an animal like that what do you do then with this body nobody wants to eat it and it's been messed around with with knives and and and, and everything and, and, and the chemicals you're, you're putting on it to save the, the skin from the hookers from the bugs so you take this, the carcass out and you put it in a nice open place in a field so that the vultures can find it and the vultures can come down and feed on it that's a, that is the best thing to do with a lion carcass like that, because you're at least feeding the vultures. Mm. Now, somebody saw this and Johnny Rodriguez 16 hours. said it was all to do with, um, with this hunter, that all he wanted was the head, which is absolute nonsense. He then fabricated the whole Cecil the Lion story. And he was being, he was being fed by animal writers in America who eventually took over the whole Cecil the Lion story. They swamped um, Johnny Rodriguez with, with reporters and everybody that came from all over the world to get the story of this famous lion. And this lion was supposed to have been the greatest lion that has ever, ever been known in Africa. And people were coming, especially to see the lion from all over the world, etc. It's absolute rubbish. It was all the fabrication, all lies of Johnny Rodriguez. And, and then, then what happened, it was taken out of his hands and uh, um, the Americans took it over and, and they, were, they were much more slicker than he was. So they obviously made a hell of a lot more money out of it than he ever did. But he made enough to keep himself happy and he'd made good friends in the animal rights fraternity all over the world. But Cecil was an, had left the game reserve um, three months before he was shot. He was nurtured on the game ranch by being fed by the game rancher to keep him there so that he could get an American hunter to come and shoot him for a very high price at 50,000 US dollars. I don't know what it was. It doesn't matter. Um, but Cecil, everything about that, that, that hunt was, was, was okay, except for what Ronnie, Johnny Rodriguez had told the whole world and what the whole world then told everybody else. So that's the story of Cecil the lion. The lion who, who'd had his day and uh, 
he put out to pasture, as it were. He, he put himself out to pasture in order to survive. And he found a very convenient place to go and live where there were no big lions to chase him all over the place and to kill him. So um, you, you have to understand how the lion family works to be able to understand you've got juveniles, juvenile nomads, other nomads, and, and just exactly how it all happens. There are stories going around that, that hunters, hunters often do themselves a lot of harm because there's one story goes around that says that, um, that lion hunters actually help the human lion conflict situation, that they, they shoot the lions that are the stock killers that are causing the farmers, the African farmers in Africa to want to kill the lions. And, 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 and this is why they, they are killed themselves by the lions because they have to stop the lions killing their cattle. Well, you know, most of the stock killing lions that, that I've killed have been, have been juveniles. I won't say juveniles, young, young adults. Certainly, you know, in, in, the, in the age class three, uh, two, two, three, and four. Um, no big lions. I, I didn't, I shot, shot two very big lions uh, one day. And they, I think, were a coalition of young, of, of males that had been kicked out of the pride by younger males and they stuck together when they went onto the farms to go and kill cattle. But those were the only two that I, that I can really say were fully adult. Another one was probably about five years old, but all the rest were much younger than that. So for, for, hunters, for hunters to tell the world that they are stopping the uh, stock killing by, by shooting, by hunting lions is not right because the lions that the hunters want are high, higher quality uh, animals than the, the nomads that are being shot. The young nomads are being shot as stock killers. Ron, um, some people are saying that, that the lion population of Wanky might be too high too because buffalo numbers are down and I think wildebeest numbers are down. Um, and and maybe there, there are too many lions in the park. You know, um, with herbivores, um, I think you can say there are too many because they they start hammer, hammering their own habitats, destroying their own habitats. But when it comes to, to, to lions, I'm not so sure that, that that can happen or that that does happen because they have this structure, this this societal behavior of pushing the young ones out when they when they are, are, are a problem in the pride and they have to look after themselves. Um, I would think that the lions probably regulate their own numbers pretty well because they're killing each other all the time and, and separating out the wheat from the chaff. And, and when, when they're pushed around in the game reserve too much by other lions, by the, the, the resident uh, um, lions with the big prides, um, they're pushed out onto other places, on, onto the game, game ranches or on, onto the cattle ranches or into the tribal areas where they're shot for, because they're, they're crop raided. They're, they are stock killers. So um, I don't know what to, to, to do to say to you to, to answer your question. I, I wouldn't think so. I, I think the lions probably regulate their own numbers pretty well. Ron, uh, moving on, I know you were involved with... Um rhino capture back in the early days in, in, in quite a big way. Um, those were the days when you didn't have much in the way of equipment to work with. Uh, just tell us about that whole program, uh, capture and translocation of rhino in, in well, I think it was Rhodesia then. Well, that's a very big story. Um, it, it started off with Lake Kariba and Operation Noah. When, as the lake was filling, it was all the higher ground became islands and, and animals got uh, marooned on the islands. And Rupert Fothergill went in there and darted all these animals or netted them and took them out. E everything from, from black mambas to tortoises to, to rhinos and, and elephants. Um, and uh, he, he did a mighty fine job. Uh, everybody, I, I know Rupert very well. I worked with him on the rhino ops. He was the only one who had any in, any experience, I think, in Africa, other than Tony Hartwell, who was the vet who, who developed the techniques of darting, fly, uh, the, making syringes, flying syringes, they call them, uh, where we fly them in, into, the, in, into the rhinos and, and gave them the narcotic. Um, so I don't know how many rhinos Rupert caught on the islands, but it was a number. Um, 
but all the other animals that he caught amounted to about 6,000 animals, which were then just put on the boats, caught in nets, put onto the land and released. Now, when Lake Kariba filled to capacity, um, 57,000 Batonka people who were living along the river, along the Zambezi River in the basin, were, had to move out. They were pushed out by the rising waters of the lake and all their huts and all their, all their villages and everything were, were drowned out. And um, as, as the lake filled up, so more and more of them pushed out and they had big evacuation um, things. Um, they, they sent lorries in and took whole, whole villages out and put them in the hinterland where, whereas they had been growing very fine crops on black alluvial soils. And they suddenly had to find grow the same crops on sandy uh, Kalahari sand soils, and it was it was not an easy time for them. But fifty seven thousand were were moved out. Half of them went onto the Zambian shore of Lake Kariba. The other half came onto the Rhodesian shore, and um, um, half went into the Kariba district, half into the Binga district. And I was the senior ranger in Binga district for five years. Rhodesian promises to the chiefs, to the Patonka chiefs. They were very, very primitive people. They were, they were um, cl classified as being Iron Age people. They, they hardly wore, wore anything at all. Um, and uh, everything was ornamental. Um, but they promised the chiefs that when the lake filled to capacity, they would be able to move back onto the lake shore where they had prepared fishing grounds, big four square mile areas of fishing grounds where all the trees before the lake filled up were bull bulldozed out so that they wouldn't interfere with the gill nets that they anticipated the fishermen would put in the water. Um, and then they, they decided they, they were, the time was right, the lake had filled up. The lake filled to capacity in 1963. And in 1964, they said, right now, you guys, you must come down and find out where you want to get go and live on the lake. Um, there wasn't a lot of places, a lot of the lake was the lake shore was rocky, very rocky lake shore. Um, but up in the Sazemba area near the Sengwa River mouth, there was a lot of flat alluvial ground up there, which was dead right for what they needed. They could turn the land into crops. And there was a lot of subsurface water with all the lake water there. So they all went up and had a good look at this place. And they said, no, we, we can't come back here because the thickets, the vast areas of heavy thickets called Jess, and uh, it was full of elephants and full of black rhinos. And there were a large number of buffalo in there as well. And they said, we can't come and live amongst all this, especially with the rhinos. Um, because they said, well, they will shoot out the elephants so that they could make way for, for, for the people to go and make their lands down there. They said, that's fine, but what about the rhinos? The rhinos chase us all over the place for no reason at all. And uh, we don't want the rhinos. So you've got to get the right. If you want us to go back to the lakes, now they have to rule the roost a little bit. You get rid of the rhinos. So Department of Internal Affairs, which, which ran the, the native affairs in, in the country, they made a decision that they, they would have all, all the rhinos shot out. And the Department of National Parks said, no, we won't shoot them out. You can't shoot them all out. There were a lot of, quite a lot of rhinos in the country at that, that, that time. So between tin, internal affairs and national parks, we came up with a, with a, a strategy where we would, we would, national parks would dart the animals and put them into pens and then put them into crates and ship them off to Wanky National Park, uh, which is 300 miles away from where we were going to release them from, from where they were living. And Rupert Fothergill came down to, to Sazima and I was appointed because I was the warden and, or game ranger in charge of the Binga district at the time, I was tasked to go and be his assistant. And um, Rupert in that, at that time was in his late 50s, I think. Um, and it turned out that this turned out to be a very much a young man's game. Um, but I learned all my darting from Richard, from, from Rupert um, and proceeded from there onwards. Um, we moved all together out of Binga, I think it was 40, 46, <coughs> me, 46 black rhinos from the Sazimba area and we released them into Wanki. And uh, most of them were bulls. I know that amongst them were 18 cows. So, there was a, a good injection of, of breeding stock going into Wanky National Park. And Wanky had had no black rhinos in it since 1934, when the last one was shot by a lady cattle rancher near, near Mukwesaidi. Um, so we, we did what we had to do. We put them all in there. It took us two years. 
the first year, 1964, Rupert and I operated together because he, uh, he uh, um, knew the ropes. I didn't know the ropes at all. But after working with him for, for three or four months, uh, hunting every day, every single day, we followed rhinos night and day. Uh, we got to learn a hell of a lot about them. At the end of those three months, I was, I, in that first year, I actually darted a few more rhinos than Rupert did because of the fact that Rupert was getting old and it was hellish. I'll tell you more about hunting just now. It was hellish hunting. It's the most exciting hunting that I have ever done. And I don't think that anyone will ever get that, that kind of hunting again. I don't think the circumstances that we had then will ever be repeated either. So it was a very unusual period. Um, we were going into these thickets, which um, at, at 10 feet, you couldn't, you couldn't get a dart into your rhino. The bush was so thick. Um, so we had to crawl in. My, my average darting range in 1964 was between 6 and 13 yards from a black rhino before I pulled a trigger and put a dart into it. Now to get it took me, it took me um, sometimes four hours to from where you could see the rhino way in the distance because we, we were hunting in the dry season. All the leaves had fallen off the thickets, and it was like a carpet of six six inches deep on the ground. It was like walking across a kitchen floor with post toasties on the ground. You couldn't do it silently, and it took me four hours to make that last close, the last hundred yards to get up to a, a, a site where I could fire my dart into the rhino. That's why we had to get so close. And um, the other thing was that I, I developed a technique going in there where uh, I would squat down and I would lift all the leaves off the ground to take my next foot, put my one foot on there, change my weight, lift over, take all the leaves off of my next footprint and so on. So by the time you were near the rhino and you look back, you could see all these bare patches behind you where you'd used your taken all the leaves away. But six, between six and 13 yards, the closest I, I, I was before I fired my dart on one occasion was two yards. Hmm. And, uh, and that rhino smacked me. It was, uh, but in, anyway, that's, that's, that's how we did it. And um, the second year, what happened in the second year was that the Tetsi fly operations started and the department needed young game rangers who knew who knew how to hunt elephants because we were we were taking elephants out of out of the, the corridors they, they put a big corridor all the way around the Zambezi valley and kept it clean of cattle and clean of game because the elephants and the buffalo were moved from Kariba were moving out of the valley in in the areas where the where the Batonka were, were farming um the elephants were eating their crops. They, they got very, few, very little off their crop lands anyway because the soils were not right. right. And when there was crop raiding, I was required to go and shoot the buffalo and the elephant when they're crop raiding. I was required to go and shoot the lions and the leopards and the hyenas when they were killing their cattle, sheep and goats. They didn't have many cattle there, but they just certainly had sheep and goats. But um, when the tsetse fly operation started, I was pulled off the tsetse ops, off the rhino ops, which didn't please me at all because I, I got my teeth into this now and uh, we, we were also developing techniques, new techniques, but th they weren't having any of this. You're going to have to go and shoot your elephants and things in the Tetsi corridor. So I really reluctantly um, left it and a, another young game, game ranger went and worked with Rupert, but he didn't, he didn't make the grade. He wasn't a, he wasn't a good caliber hunter and um, uh, Rupert carried on he did all the darting and the other guy looked after the camp and the rhinos in the pens and Rupert was a very good he knew what he was doing exactly what he was doing in fact and uh, he 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 captured a lot of these animals but then one day he went out on his own with his two trackers and they they saw ahead of them they saw two female rhinos two big cows it was a, a cow and a very big calf it was nearly as big as its mother then and they were feeding off, um, off some thick bush. They were in the thick bush. So he went up to go and dart us. He left his trackers behind, which we all did. You can't take your trackers up. One man makes enough noise to two make twice as much. And noise was the big thing. You had to be able to get through that bush, through that, th that thicket, and through those leaves without, without exciting the rhino. And the rhino's got very sharp ears. And... Um, and the other thing about them is what we discovered and we didn't know. And to this day, most people who, who 
deal with rhino management don't know, black rhinos are nocturnal. They, and they're solitary. They, they don't go around in a herd like a white rhino goes around in a herd. And the white rhino grazes during the day. The black rhino goes to sleep. It goes into these thickets. It lies down and it goes to sleep. And you've got to be able to get up to it within darting range and get a clear shot through, through this thicket stuff before the rhino realized that you were there. If it did, if it did you, then you had a fun and games because there was no trees to climb. You just had to get out the way. And we had a lot of, I was knocked down very badly. A lot of other guys were, were injured. Rupert was injured. Um, he had, I think he had caught <coughs> six rhinos in 1965. And um, he went in after these two cows. And there was a big commiferate tree, these big cunny dirt trees. You can't kill them. You can just chop them off and stick them in the ground and they grow. <coughs> and he went up to the edge of this thicket. He was within 10 yards of these two cows, but he now had to, this is where the patients came and you have to wait and have your patients. And, and he was standing next to a tree that he could climb up. If you could get six feet above the ground, the rhino wouldn't touch you. It would stand underneath and look at you like this, but it wouldn't touch you. It wouldn't push the tree down. Um, so if you had a tree to climb up, you were lucky because half of those trees you couldn't, most of those trees you couldn't climb. Not very big either. So he was standing next to this tree and he was, the two rhinos were sitting were about 10 yards from him feeding and he was waiting for them to move out. The wind was blowing across him and down that, down behind him this way. And uh, so he was happy with that. He was waiting for them to get out and then he could put a dart in the one. And if he was lucky when it went down, if the other one stayed there, he would have got them both. But it didn't reach that stage because while he was standing waiting there, one of these cows must have been an oestrus because behind Rupert was a big rhino bull. It was feeding in another bit of the bush behind him. And Rupert was watching these rhinos in front of him. And this bull came up behind him, not, not in any way conscious of the fact that he was there, but he could hear these rhino cows feeding. And he could obviously smell the one was an oestrus. And Rupert was standing leaning up and just quietly waiting his time to put a dart into one of these rhinos when he felt he heard next to his foot, he heard this, this rhino going. <laughs> it was sucking in his, and they, they suck the air in and out the nostrils. And he looked down and the horn was passing his ankle like this in front of him. And he turned around to see what he was doing with his dart gun and this rhino ran back and then came at him and, and he didn't have a chance to climb the tree or to dart it or anything. This rhino hit him in the stomach two inches below the belly button and picked him up and, and threw him up in the air towards where the two cows were. And it ripped open his stomach. And he hit the ground. And then the rhino, the, the bull had another go at him. And he was holding his intestines in with his, with his hand. And the rhino came at him and he dived to the side. Now, when, when you, a rhino hooks, hooks you, a black rhino, when it hooks you, if it hooks and misses, it turns his head sideways and it smacks his head sideways like that. It's a double action thrust. And so the rhino got onto him and tried to hook him, couldn't, I like hit him on the shoulder, on the right shoulder. And it broke his arm halfway between his shoulder and his elbow, broke it in half. It completely smashed the ball and socket joint of his, of his shoulder and it kicked him sideways. Now, fortunately, the two rhinos heard all this kerfuffle because the big bull was <laughs> making all these noises. And the two cows came out and ran over, over Rupert so now he had three rhinos and he was lying on the ground holding his tummy in his arm was was slack and and the rhinos then started worrying amongst themselves and going around in circles and eventually the two cows took off the bull took off after them and they left him behind and then the two chaps came in and picked him and uh, they they eventually to cut a very long story short they cassavacked him out and uh he was flown by uh, air force helicopter to salisbury general hospital where he where he was um, uh, he survived <laughs> he was fixed up and he was okay but that's just one little story I've got several like that uh, it was it was the most dangerous hunting that I've ever done the most exhilarating hunting I've ever done and I needed to use all the wits I had to be able to dot the rhinos that I did in the end um, me and my team all together because um, we have to admire the team were wonderful people um, we caught and moved over a seven-year period. We caught and moved 140 black rhinos. Ron, uh, tell us some more hunting stories. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard. 
we we had darting guns. The, 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 the dart guns that we had were brought by the vet attorney Hartman from America. And th these were dog, these were dart guns that were used to shoot stray dogs in city backyards. If there were stray dogs running around, you see these cartoons with them, these guys with big nets and the cats and dogs with big nets. Well, they started using darts to use that. And it was a little alum aluminum thing about two inches long with a woolen flight and a, and a needle at the end. And Tony Hartshorn developed these so that we could use them on rhinos. Now, as, as long as you, you, you weren't too close to a rhino, um, you could do that because the skin is very thick and the impact is heavy and the needle breaks very easy. So um, what this really meant was that when we were hunting in this very thick bush, the, dot, the, the maximum distance this dart could fly, and that was at about a 45 degree angle, was, was 25 yards. That's, that's the maximum distance you could get out of it, but you couldn't, you couldn't use it at that distance. Um, so we, I decided, no, we had to get something better than that. So a friend of mine made a, took, took my old Farkasson action falling block 400, 450 rifle, elephant rifle, and he converted it to a dart gun. Now, the Farkasson action thing um, is, is got a lever underneath and the whole block drops down. So you can put a long, you can put a three foot dart in if you want to from behind. With the, the capture guns that we were using, we were using compressed CO2 with, with these uh, soda water siphons in there to, to, to help fire the dart. Totally different kettle of fish. We then made new darts. And the darts that we used, we used Diesel, in di diesel injector tubing, which has got a very thin hole, but it's a very thin, thick stem um, because the needles were breaking off. You'd fire, hit a rhino, break off, and the rhino ran off with a, with a needle in it, and you, you'd lost an opportunity. So we, we corrected all those things. We got everything fine. And, and then in, in 1970, they brought another guy in who, who a very good hunter, Paul Kutsia. Paul knew nothing about darting rhinos. He knew he was very good with elephants and everything else. He was an exquisitely good hunter. Um, he had one problem and that was he was a fatalist. When we were hunting terrorists up there, he used to say, listen, doesn't matter what you do. If that terrorist bullet's got your name on it, it's gonna hit you. Doesn't matter what you do. If that rhino is gonna get at me, doesn't matter what I do. So therefore I can do what I want to do. That's virtually what he said. And I said, Paul, you're, you're, you're tempting fate now. You're going to come short. But no, he wouldn't have it. So, but, but he was a very good hunter. He learned very well. And I taught him all I knew about d darting rhinos with the new dart gun. He had another one made similar to the one that I had. And uh, then, then it was decided, because it became so time absorbing, I had my own station. I was running the Gonorajor National Park at that time. <clears throat> I used to come back for one month and Paul would do the hunting. And he would go to Marangora, which was his station, and I would come back and do the hunting. So that we had two competent people doing the darting, um, and the station still still were able to be run, sort of. And um, but the darting was the big thing. And in, in the one month, in the month of of August, August, yes, the month of August, at a place called the Ruya, right up in the north, next to the Mozambique border, I darted twenty three rhinos and darted them and moved them down from the north of Rhodesia, right the way down to the Gonorrhoea National Park, where we released them into the Chihunja Hills. And we eventually put 81 rhinos into the, into the Gonorrhoea. That was Paul and I together. But that month I took 23 out of the rear. Now, now Paul, Paul, look, don't get me wrong. I, I, I like this guy very much, but he was, a, he was his own worst enemy in a lot of ways. Because as soon as he heard that I had darted 23 rhinos, he said, well, they must have all been tied to trees or something. And then he set out to go and catch 24 rhinos. And I went back, I was actually in the university at the time when he was doing the second lot of darting, the second phase. And, and I was writing my university uh, finals. And um, he went up and took some rhinos out of the last place we darted. And they went on to a place called the Ruya. It's called the Tendi, the Tendi Thicket in, in the Gokwe district. And there were, it was an area that had been shot out by, by the Tsetse, by, by the, the black um, Mashana hunters who went in with three or three. So they were supposed to shoot bushbuck, kudu, bushbuck and, and warthogs only because those were the meals that the most Tsetse flies had and to leave all the others. National parks took out the buffalo and the, and the elephant. That's what I did when we were down there. So. Um, Anyway, 
um, he went, the, this bush had been standing there for five years, thickets with no elephants going through them, no buffaloes going through them, and they were as thick as Hades. Oh, I nearly said a bad word there. It gets very thick indeed. And uh, you, 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 you couldn't push through it. it and the, the, the leaf litter was six inches deep by then. Nothing, there was nothing in there except five rhinos, five black rhinos, very extensive thicket. So Paul says, no, Paul and I had gone down there to try it. I had caught two rhinos in the Sabi and put them into the Gonorrhea shore. They were both females. Um, I took the last of the ones in the Sabi Valley. And then we went up to try and get a bull, at least we had one bull and two cows. And we thought, well, at least we got that far. And he and I went up there to the tent to, to try and, uh, uh, and dart a bull. He knew where the, these five bulls were. So we said, well, let's go in there. We found a cow and calf. We, a little away there, we put them into the Chirisa game it? because we, we weren't taking any. It was 600 miles down to the, down to the Gona Rajor. So he said, I know where there are bullet, bull rhinos. So we went into the Tendi thicket and we started following. These things took off in front of us. Or one of them did anyway, very close. And I couldn't see it. I couldn't see anything where I should have seen it. I've never hunted in, in such thick bush in all my life. And I've hunted some very thick bush. We just couldn't see these rhinos. So I said to Paul, I said, listen, this is crazy. If we go keep doing this now, we're going to end up getting nailed and we're not going to get our rhino. I said, I said, yes, we go and find out where they're drinking. And we put a platform up in a tree over with their drinking place. I had a, a, a thing with a rear stat on it, a light where we could put it down and slowly open it up. And we could have darted the rhino at night followed it the next morning and found it asleep and then picked it up and taken away. That's the best way. That was the safest way to have handled those rhinos. But Paul says, no, no. He says, I'm going to, the fatalist that he was, he said, I'm going to handle these rhinos. I'm going to tackle them on their own terms. So I said, Paul, don't be crazy. This is not normal thick bush, this, this chest. It's very heavy. No, he's going to do that. So anyway, <laughs> I went to university. He went up there with everything. And he was, the first day he went out, well, the, first of all, they built holding pens to put the rhinos made out of mapani poles, sunk into the ground three feet and seven feet up and strapped and bracketed and everything because the rhinos are very strong animals. And, um, and then he decided, right, next morning, he's going in to get his rhino in the Tendi Jess. So he goes in with his tracker. Uh, um, Capesa was his name. Famous tech tracker. And Paul was just as famous as his tracker. And uh, they went in after this rhino and they flushed it and they flushed it and they flushed it. And when that starts happening, the rhino gets crosser and crosser and crosser. So it's he's, the scene is being set there in this very, very thick bush. So eventually he had two, two European game rangers with him. He had his black tracker with him and himself with a rifle. One of the game rangers um, had a 458 Magnum with him just in case this rhino got him down. Um, Rupert Fothergill used to say, we've come to catch rhinos, not to kill them. So put your rifle away. I don't want you to come with it. <laughs> this is what he was like. But um, Paul left these two guys behind outside to follow 50 yards behind him, not because of anything like that, but because four people walking through the bush makes a hell of a noise when the, the dead leaves are six inches thick. So, and the, these rhinos have got such good hearing. So anyway, he was following this little lot. And then eventually he said to his tracker, you're making too much noise. You also go back and stay back. Just stay behind me anyway. Just try and keep me in sight. And then he went ahead and um, followed this, this bull. And uh, the next thing he knew was that right in front of him, I'm talking about six, seven feet in front of him, the bush opened up and this black rhino, big massive black rhino bull was in a full charge straight at him. And he realized then he didn't have time to, to fire a dart into it. Um, it was very thick. He couldn't, he couldn't just push a dart through the bush like you can push a bullet through thick bush. You can't do that with a dart because the dart deflects. So this rhino was, was right on top of him and he turned and he ran. And he was trying to, now you can imagine with all these bushes in front of his face, he had to pull his way through this little dot and this rhino was going full ball. And uh, the first thing that he knew was that he took, the rhino got a horn in behind his knee and it pushed it into his buttock for 18 inches, right up into his, into his buttocks, right up his leg, parallel with the bone. And it flicked him up in the air. And there was just blood everywhere. 
and um, he came down on top of the rhino and he sat on top of top of its back like a, like a horse like this and then the rhino was running around <laughs> trying to get him off and it couldn't get him off and Paul just hung on and meanwhile he's bleeding like a stuck pig and then the rhino took off and it peeled him off underneath the bushes and the rhino fortunately ran on and Paul hit the ground now nobody had seen this they just heard everything going on they'd heard the <laughs> noise so they thought, oh, Paul's darted it. The next thing we hear is Paul shouting for Capesa, Capesa. This is his tracker. So the tracker comes up to see him. Capesa thought he'd got a dart into the rhino and would run off. And he'd gone there now to pick up the tracks and go and find where the trino, rhino had gone to sleep. But it wasn't that. Paul was lying on the ground, bleeding like a stuck pig. He had a hole in the back of his leg above his knee, right up his thigh, with a whole horn had gone right in up to his buttocks. It flicked him up in the air after to gored him, flicked him up in there, came down on top of him, of him like that. But coming down, coming down, he had fallen over the front and it got a horn through the front of his thigh, coming out the hole at the back as well. So that was even more blood and guts. And this is how he was lying there and he was shouting for help. The two white game rangers at the back thought, oh, he's got his rhino. They're so used to him killing his rhino. Camel and the other guy came up to him. He said, as high as you could look up in the jest, you just saw blood. It was just splattered all over the all over the thick bushes, all over the sticks, all over the leaves, all over everything, and it was squirting out of him like a like a hose pipe. So they they packed everything up and they tied him up, and um, got him. Um, Dave Scammell then ran five miles back to back to the camp where there were other people still making the pens, and uh, radioed from there to Salisbury, Harare now, to say that Paul had been hurted. That we, we need a we need a Casavac, we need a helicopter to take him out. He's very badly hurt. So um, then having done that, they left, there, there were two other white guys there doing the, doing the building of, of, the, of the pens. And <coughs> he took the whole gang on, on the lorry and drove back to where Paul was. And then they cut a road through the thickets into where he was lying. With, with, with the, the, the Land Rover went in to get him up. When he was on the Land Rover, they took the Land Rover back to camp five miles away and they strapped him all up. They put him on a drip and uh, we game rangers had, were taught how to do all these different things. We put him on a drip. We gave him morphine. Um, and we left him lying on the back of the Land Rover because we didn't want to move him. And we were waiting for, for the chopper to come and pick him up and take him away. Well, they didn't have a chopper. I don't know what was happening. Remember, we were fighting a war there in those days. And um, so what happened then was uh, the, the Air Force decided they were going to send an aircraft called a Trojan, which was like a small Cessna, but it had been set out with, with a place where you could put stretchers in the back for, for casavacking people out. And at Tendi, there was the district commissioner had an, an airstrip which he kept clean at all times. So at, just before sunset, this aircraft came and landed and um, they drove the Land Rover up. There was a paramedic on board and a pilot. So they they immediately rest all Paul's wounds because by then he was as white as a sheet and as weak as a lamb. He, he, he was going, he was very badly hurt. So they then put him onto the stretcher, tied him onto the stretcher, put him onto the back of the aircraft, said goodbye to everybody and they took off into the sunset and up like that turned and turned around. Now they had about 300 miles to get to, to Salisbury. And the idea was that they were going to land him at the in New Serum Air Force Base um, in, in, in Salisbury, which is next to the, the main airport, and, uh, um, and have him treated there. They got special people in to come there because that was the quickest they, could, they thought they could get him, get stuff in. So <laughs> you're not going to believe this, and neither is anybody else. They take off and they're flying back at a fair altitude with a bright full moon back towards Salisbury. They got over the, the, the white farming areas and they could see all the white farmers' houses with the lights on. Um, they all had generators um, beneath them, but they were going straight on comms with, with the Air Force. And the next thing they hear a big bang, boom, and a piston went through the, the engine top. And the engine just cut up, oh, dead, stone dead. Now they've got, they're sitting in an airplane with the wind whistling through, they could hear it, hear a whoosh, the wind like that. The pilot got on May Day to, to, to there and they said, listen, we are now going to crash in the middle of the field. So there, there, there's fields below us. We can see their plow fields. We're going to land there. We're in this part of the Sonoya district. 
and and we need a helicopter. We need an urgency. This guy is going to die if he doesn't get to hospital. So <laughs> people don't believe this. This aircraft came down in the middle of the night in the moonlight. Fortunately, it's the moonlight, and it landed landed on a plowed field. Um, it was October, or no, it was August. So the, the farmers were, were preparing their lands for the, for the coming rains, rainy season in November. And, and of course, they, all those farmers had contour ridges all across their, their lands. The aircraft came down, touched down, started digging in, into the plowed field. The front wheel on the nose hit a contour, broke off. The aircraft did a, a nose upside down, didn't burst into, into flames. The two guys, the pilot and the, and the medic got out. They um, they then opened the, the the doors and everything for Paul, and then they grabbed his stretcher and dragged him through the land in case this aircraft was going to was going to blow up. When they got to the edge of the land, all Paul's wounds had opened up again; he was bleeding again. So the medic ran back to the aircraft with dri petrol dripping all, all over the place, of course. And he got his medical bag, came back again with more drips, and and while he was doing that. The chopper comes out. The farmer told them exactly where they were. So the Air Force knew where to come. And this, this is now in the middle of the night, sort of 10 o'clock at night, nine, half past nine, 10 o'clock at night. And the next thing, the chopper comes in and it lands in the land right next door to where Paul is. And now Paul, Paul is now almost compass, not non compass mentis. Um, but they put everything in and, and they got him on, on. There was then a surgeon on board the chopper. They came out and looked at Paul, did what they had to do, gave him whatever it was they had to give him, put him on the chopper, and then the bloody chopper wouldn't start. Jeez. It just, it's refused to start. And the pilot was, why, 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 trying to get, they, they, they were the jet engine, you know, those uh, uh, wait, helicopters. He eventually got it going. And, and then they, they left the pilot and the other guy there, and they took Paul straight off, this time straight to the Salisbury General Hospital in, in the middle of the, Sorry. of the town. Sorry. Now, I had been told what was going on while I was writing my final exams. And um, I was at the, at the hospital when, uh, when Paul came in. And I promise you, he was as white as a sheet. I've never seen a human person as white as this. He was just drained of blood. Lost a lot of blood by then. Yeah. So then they, uh, they whisked him into the hospital. I went with him. And um, then they kicked me out. <laughs> they said, no, you can't come any further than this. So the next day I went around and saw him and they'd been giving him pure blood um, to, to, because that's what he needed. And he, a bit of color was back in his face. Um, but that, that was, that's the worst of our, of our attacks. So um, uh, rhino attacks on, on one of our rangers. It was a hell of an incident that. But to have all those things happen, it's absolutely unbelievable. Incredible. Ron, we're going to have to... You wanted stories here, you're getting them. Oh, these stories need to go on the record, Ron. <laughs> hey, great stories, man. And uh, we, need to get, we need to get them down. 